right? So I haven't given you a problem that you could imagine writing an algorithm for. I haven't told you what the best alignment is. Suppose there's two possible alignments. One has one gap and one, and one mismatch, and the other has three gaps and zero mismatches. Which of those two should you prefer? Are gaps worse? Are mismatches worse? All right, so here's how we get around that. And now we're going to be able to finally define the problem completely, which is, in the input to the problem, I will give you not only two strings, but also I'll give you some numbers, which tells you how much penalty you get for the different possible errors you might make, for gaps and for various mismatches. Okay? So in addition to the two strings, we will assume that through experimentation, Uh, we've experimentally determined penalties for gaps and mismatches. Okay? So now, you as the algorithm designer will be simply told, as part of the input, that any time you use a gap, in one of your alignments, it's going to cost you, and it's going to cost you, you know, something like five, right? You just told some number. Okay, I'm just going to abstractly write pen subscript gap. Okay, but this would be some number like five. Five bucks a gap. Similarly, if you mismatch a given pair of letters, say A and T, you're also told as part of the input that you will pay some penalty specific to A and T. Okay, so maybe you're told every time you, you match A and T together, it costs you 12 bucks. Okay, so every gap costs you five, every mismatch of A and T costs you 12. Question? In general, how different are the mismatch costs for different letters? So uh, this is going to depend on the application. So basically, the way you'd come up with these uh, is you basically uh, you know, you'd take some sort of labeled data, okay? So you'd actually take some sort of small data set where you kind of knew the answer. You just eyeballed it, and you'd say, this, these, things are, these two are more similar than these two. And from that, you'd reverse engineer what would be the appropriate penalties, and then you'd apply this to data which you haven't hand inspected, okay? So that's what I mean by experimentally determine these, all right? But from your perspective, from your designer, right, you want to export something really useful, right, to whoever's going to use your software. So you're just going to have a take as a parameter. You know, you just, what you want to say is, my algorithm doesn't care what your weights are. Okay, just tell me what they are, and I'm going to do the right thing. Okay, so as the algorithm designer, you say, look, you know, the user of my software, it's your responsibility to figure out the appropriate weights. Then just tell me what they are. I'm going to find the best alignment. That is the sort of sharing of work between the programmer and the person who uses this algorithm. Okay? Good. Okay, so for just for concreteness, think, you think of this as five bucks and twelve bucks, something like that. Um, and then basically penalties add. Okay. So basically here, the total penalty for this one would be in the running example seventeen dollars. Okay. Or abstractly, it would be whatever the penalty of a gap is plus your penalty for mismatching A and T. And maybe in some applications, all mismatches are exactly the same. Maybe it doesn't matter which pair of letters. It always costs you 12 bucks. Maybe in some contexts, some mismatches are worse. Okay? Just either for uh, biological reasons or just, you know, experimentally looking at previous data. Okay? And the algorithm that we'll talk about eventually supports that. All right. So, good. So, I hope the algorithmic problem, the computational problem, we haven't solved it, but I hope at least we've defined it. I hope you agree. Okay? So best match is just defined as the alignment with smallest total penalty Okay, and this has a name. This is sort of a famous concept in computational genomics. The needleman wunsch score, uh, named after the proposers. So 
this is these guys were biologists in the early 70s. And the interpretation is if two strings have a small NW score, then you interpret them as being similar. And if they have a large NW score, then you interpret them as dissimilar. Okay, and again here, what is small, what is large, again that would be determined just you know from experiments. Okay. Right. So so what? Right? So what does this have to do really with us? Here's why this is sort of so interesting for the algorithmist, sort of observing this sort of struggle to have a good definition of genome similarity. So, yeah, suppose you don't care about computer science, you don't care about algorithms, you're just trying to make some inferences about genomes and, and their substrings, and you say, okay, well, we have this standard definition of what's similar and what's dissimilar, I have all these fragments, I just, I want to know, what are the similar ones, what are the dissimilar ones? Clearly, that's a primitive, which, you know, if you work in this field, you're going to want to know the answer to over and over and over again. Okay? I guess I forgot to tell you applications. Um... So why do people want to know this? You know, so just to give a couple quick examples, one is extrapolation. Maybe you've taken something like the mouse genome, you've understood it super well, and you understand this particular sequence encodes some particular function in the mouse. And you'd like to hypothesize that there's some analogous sequence in the human genome which is encoding for exactly the same function. But an obvious approach of doing that is you say, find me the part of the human genome which is most similar to this understood part of the mouse genome. Okay, so that's one reason is extrapolation. And another reason would be to understand which species evolved from which and when. Okay, so you have three species A, B, and C, and you wanted to know the order with which they were differentiated, with which one evolved from the other. You might naturally look at the genomes and hypothesize that the more similar the genomes are to each other, the closer they are to each other in the evolutionary tree. Okay? All right, so these are just some of the reasons why this is such a fundamental primitive. 